I'm on kind of a poetry roll these days. So we have a poem to begin with. It's by Ted Kozer, who was the Poet Laureate of the United States some time ago. The title of the poem is The Red Wing Church. There's a tractor in the doorway of a church in Red Wing, Nebraska, in a coat of mud and straw that drags the floor. A broken plow sprawls beggar-like behind it on some planks that make a sort of roadway up the steps. The steeple's gone. A black tar paper scar that lightning might have made replaces it. They've taken it down to change the house of God to Homer Johnson's barn. But it's still a church with clumps of tiger lilies in the grass and one of those box-like glassed-in signs that give the sermon's topic reading now a bird's nest and a little broken glass. The good works of the Lord are all around. The steeple top is standing in a garden just up the alley. It's a hen house now. Fat leghorns gossip at its crowded door. Pews stretch on porches up and down the street. The stained glass windows style the mayor's house and the bells atop the firehouse in the square. The cross is only God knows where. The good works of the Lord are all around. They are not nailed down and stuck in one place anymore. They are all over town. They are everywhere. So much everywhere that you begin to look for them in anticipation of seeing them. And that anticipation, that possibility that you might see one of those things, one of those happenings somewhere as you walk, as you drive, begins to shape your seeing, your way of perceiving your world, and that in turn shapes your behavior, your outlook, your whole way of living. In a way, that is exactly what Jesus is trying to do. He has announced that the kingdom of God is here. Now, this is the time. The time has come. So repent, turn yourselves, so you can see it as it comes, so it, you can be there and receptively waiting as it approaches you, so you can be part of it. He has called his small crew of followers. It will grow. He's got four so far. They're going to join him in demonstrating the everywhereness of the reign of God. That's what they're called to do. And so now, they're going to town. <laughs> Literally, they're going to town. They're going to Capernaum, which is a big town. It's like somebody from Rapidan or Good Thunder or Vernon Center going to Mankato. That's a big place. You know, lots of people, lots going on. It's exciting. And they're going there because of the people. Because Jesus is going to make the case because he's going to call these people into this movement as well. So they go to the synagogue. It's the Sabbath. That's what Jesus does. That's where the people are. And immediately, Mark tells us, Jesus runs into opposition, resistance. Now, just a few verses earlier, Jesus is in the wilderness following his baptism, and he has his confrontation with Satan, and he wrestles with his own demons, whatever those are. They're not named. <laughs> Fear of what's going to happen. Doubt about who he is and how this is going to work out. Confusion, whatever those things are, we don't know, but we can relate to that. Having had that experience, he probably thinks, okay, that's behind me now. It's all good. It'll be smooth sailing from here. And he doesn't have to go very far and find out that's just not the case. He runs into this man who's possessed by demons, Mark tells us, in the synagogue, in church, of all places. He's right there. As Jesus is teaching, the man shows up, whether he's there all along and just this starts to come out of him or he... He finds out what's going on and he comes in from the outside. We don't know, but here he is. And he says to Jesus, he outs Jesus. This is what he does. 
He says, Jesus of Nazareth, what have you got to do with us? What are you doing here? You don't belong here. You're nobody. You are from Nazareth. You're from no place. You're a nobody from no place. What are you doing here? It's, it's, they're trying to blow him off, but then almost immediately, realizing that's not going anywhere, they say, he says, have you come to destroy us? Because we know who you are. We know you are the Holy One of God. So we have Jesus of Nazareth, the human, and we have the Holy One of God, the divine, right there in that brief declaration by the possessed one, which is really interesting, is it not? It's the one full of evil, full of darkness, that recognizes the light. I think that the, that is so stark and so sort of arresting. It gets our attention, and you wonder, what's going on here? They recognize each other. Opposites know each other when they confront each other. I think it's also, Mark wants us to begin associating the opposition to Jesus with Satan, with with the darkness, with the dark forces of the earth right away so that here Jesus runs into Satan then runs into a person possessed by the demons. What's the resistance he will run into later? In the temple, it's the authorities. And Mark is telling us they are possessed as well. We should just be aware of that. That's what Jesus is up against. In response to this, well... This made me think this week of some, um, now, this, just keep this between us, okay? Nobody else needs to know this. It just reminds me of some altercations, some rough relationships I've had with people in churches down through the years. And I'm not saying they're evil. Nothing like that. I'm saying we all bring our stuff wherever we go. And our demons come to church with us. Actually, they like to come to church. I know that because mine come all the time. They won't stay home. They show up here all the time. Sundays and otherwise, they love church. So Jesus' response to this guy who's there with his demons full-blown and out front, literally he says, shut up and come out of him, which is wonderful. I think Jesus' response is always geared in terms of energy to what is needed, what the situation or the person calls for. And the the people marvel at him because um, the, the demons comply. Jesus says something and it happens. Who else does that? Who else speaks things into being? Ah. Mark is telling us without telling us that this is God with us, in case you don't know. This is what God does. This is what happens when the realm of God, when the energy of God, the spirit, the fullness of God is embodied and brought into being into this world. This is what happens when the kingdom comes. This is the possibility for freeing people up and sending the darkness packing. People marvel at Jesus ability to do this. The word is exousia, which kind of sounds like what it is. It's authority, it's power, it's energy, it's command. His exousia to make things happen, to send the darkness away. And what is happening here is Mark is establishing Jesus' credentials, his power, his authority over the chaos of the world, over the demonic forces of the world, over the evil of the world, over the dominant power of that part of the world at the time and its homegrown collaborators thinking Rome and that confrontation is coming and that's what we're getting revved up for. That's what Jesus is preparing for. That's what is is about to happen towards the end of the story. So this is about establishing Jesus' power his ability to make things happen, to change the world. So is that it? Is that what it's all about? I ask because in some people's minds it is. It's all about Jesus and what he can do. And it seems to me that if it's all located in this way, it's like putting all your eggs in one basket. What is then the future for God's movement? What happens afterwards? 
And we know that at the end of Mark's gospel, that's the question. Because the women who come to the tomb looking for Jesus' body are told he's risen, go tell the others, he'll meet you. And they run away scared and they don't say anything. What happens after Jesus is no longer doing it? It's like the Red Wing Church before it's all departed and scattered all over the place. So now the good works of the Lord are all around. So what? What of it? What difference does it make? Well, maybe this. Yesterday um, would have been 46 years in one week since my dad died. 46 years ago, January 24th, 1975. And uh, this is not a, a... a plea for sympathy. This is just, it's one of those repeating events in one's life, the anniversary of which you mark. And we all have those things, those times that we repeat. And they're different each time, but they're the same each time. Well, his funeral, which would have been like uh, 46 years ago on probably Thursday or Friday, because it, it had to be postponed because of a snowstorm, because of a blizzard, which was about the third or fourth major snowstorm in that month in 1975. It was a horrible winter. So I was a senior in high school, and one day my dad is there larger than life and making decisions and calling the shots, and the next day he's gone. And all of that cold, dark, bleak heaviness of winter that was all around then with his departure just came in and took up residence within me. What I'm saying is that grief can be like being possessed. It can take over and it can move you in ways you don't want to be moved and take you places you don't want to go or stop you when you want to move. It, it's a powerful thing and it was. And I knew um, that morning that something was off because when I left for school, Dad was still home. He was a rural mail carrier, and he was always out by 6.30, 6.45 at the latest, gone out of the house, long gone before I was ready to go to school around 8 o'clock. And so he was having a heart attack when I was getting on the school bus, and I had no idea. So mid-morning that day, the superintendent comes to the classroom where I am with all my classmates, and he points at me and says, get your coat and meet me in the office. And everybody goes, ooh, what did you do? Yeah, right? No idea, though, there's this feeling in the back of my head, you know, thought. So I go, and he tells me what's happened. And he said, meet me at the car, and I'll take you there. So we drive to Mankato, and he drops me at the hospital where Dad is. And my cousin is there to meet me, ahead of me, because he knows what's going on and because he knows some things that I have not been, uh, have not heard, have not been told about dad's condition and what's probably going to happen. My cousin is about two years older than I am, a little more than that, and he's in college. Well, he cuts classes for that day to spend the day with me because he's there to prepare me for what is probably going to be. He was there then, fully, put everything else aside and was there. And he did that again and again and again and again. He was there for me time and time again, and he still is, and he still would be. That's the relationship. Our pastor at that time, his name was Ron Gaylor, and he and my dad had a connection because they were both World War II Navy guys, and they both loved church. And they talked and loved to talk politics, not always agreeing, but they were civil and enjoyed each other's company. And sometimes Ron sat with my dad at football games when I played, which was probably a good influence on my dad in, in those settings. It's not always bad to have the pastor sitting next to you, except in my case, it wouldn't help you at all, I don't think. But... <clears throat> 
A week and a half, maybe two weeks after the funeral, Ron called me up and said, I want to buy you lunch. Where do you want to go? Well, Vernon Center had two cafes, Diane's or Swanee's. So we went to Swanee's because it was a little bigger space. And we sat and talked. And this became an irregular repeating event. Every so often, he would call up, and we would go have coffee, we'd go have a meal, and we would talk. And he would just ask, How, how it's going? How's school? How's basketball? How's baseball? How's uh, home life? How are your friends? How's whoever you're spending your time with now? How's that going? How's college later on? Because it's carried on after high school. And he would ask these questions, and then he would just listen. He didn't try to tell me much or steer me at all. He just was there again and again and again and again. And I wondered if Dad had asked him to look after me just in case this went uh, awry. I don't know. But he did look after me, and he kept dragging me into things that were church-related. So I would help with a Sunday school class. I was recruited to help with a week at summer camp, which was torture. <laughs> I uh, was involved in a work project when I had no idea what I was doing. I was recruited to help serve communion. I was recruited to preach for him when he was on vacation. I mean, talk about trust. He kept doing that over and over and over again. He was guiding me towards ministry, though I was sort of keeping it at arm's length. So you can blame him a lot for this. He set up for me uh, a January term in the Twin Cities at Emmanuel United Methodist Church with Grant Tanner in January of 1978. Uh, Emmanuel Church then was down just a block or two north of Franklin Avenue on 11th, I think. So... Um, a little bit west of Chicago, really interesting neighborhood. And so I, small town boy, saw a lot, experienced a lot, and Grant shepherded me through that. And he is still a good, close friend. And um, Ron did that, and he did all kinds of other things. When Julie and I were married in Christ Chapel at Gus Davis, Ron and Chaplain LV officiated at the wedding. So he had a Lutheran and a Methodist. Covered at least two bases. <laughs> and years later then, when <clears throat> I had been ordained and was serving, Ron then welcomed us to the community where he had retired and was living. And I then became his pastor. And about four years later, officiated at his funeral. So the things, the relationships, the way life goes is fascinating. So Ron and Chaplain Elvie, and there were a couple of professors that, that um, you know, shepherded me, that one I've stayed in touch with and talked with occasionally, um, classmates from high school and from college and from seminary, um, friends I've made in the communities where we've lived and served, and um, colleagues in ministry who are dear friends. Um, my big sister, Sue, and my big brother, Joel, and my middle brother, John, in his own way. And Julie, <clears throat> that woman that continues to put up with me. I mean, nobody knows the trouble she's seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. I think Jesus looks away sometimes because, oh, no, oy vey. She hangs in. She hangs in. If there is a candidate for Methodist sainthood, she is one. The good works of the Lord are all around. So, these people are in church. They're in the synagogue. Jesus is there. His people are there. Or they're at the coffee shop or at, at the, the grocery store or at City Hall or at the Capitol or in front of the governor's house or wherever, and they're doing their thing. And this guy shows up who is possessed with his anger. 
possessed by his grief, by his pain, by his frustration, by his anguish, by his loss. And he's rattling on his own inconvenient truth. And Jesus and his people, they listen and they wait. And then when there's an opening, they say, all right, now just shut up for a minute. Would you just be quiet just a minute? Take a breath. Take a breath. Okay, now, what's going on with you? What's going on within you? And then they shut up themselves and listen. All those people who I have known, who have befriended me, who have watched out for me, all of you people who have put up with me, who have spent time with me, who have called out my darkness or called me out of the darkness that is often there, you have invited it, you have waited for it, you have watched for it and waited for me perhaps for the light to come on again, which it always does because it's in each of us. It just sometimes gets overwhelmed by the darkness. I think I know why Mark doesn't tell us any more about the man who was possessed so that he's free to be whoever he needs to be so that he can be me or he can be you as needed in the moment. There's this church in Red Wing, Nebraska. There's this church in Adrian, in Magnolia, Minnesota, and in Olivia and Bird Island, Minnesota, and Wyndham, and Alexandria, and Golden Valley, Minnesota. This church that's sort of departed in ways. So that now the good works of the Lord are all over. And I meet them and see them all the time. Thank God. And thank you. Amen.